You know, this talk is meant to be a practical, easy to understand, troubleshooting type of talk. It's not meant to be heavy on research. It's not meant to give you numbers that are over your head. It's meant to be um, something that will help you have a discussion with your physician about different sleep issues um, or different symptoms of Parkinson's that might be affecting your sleep, okay? And so, you know, why is sleep important in Parkinson's disease? I know a lot of people worry about getting good sleep, and so why in particular is this important for folks who have Parkinson's? And, you know, in my experience in treating folks with both Parkinson's disease and sleep disorders, you know, getting a good night of sleep, at least better than maybe what you were getting, can help with improving your motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Things like tremor, trouble with walking, balance, it really seems to, to have an impact on your overall mobility, believe it or not. It can also improve cognition. You know, we know that cognitive changes are something that happens in Parkinson's disease, and people with sleep issues can also have trouble with focusing, paying attention, you know, I've had many nights of poor sleep as a resident and a trainee, where the next day I'm like, man, I really, do. I need like three cups of coffee because I can't think. So that can really improve your cognition, can improve your daytime energy, of course, um, improve your balance, as I mentioned. And then folks who have dyskinesia, which is a fancy way of saying extra movements with um, too much medication, um, getting a good night of sleep can help reduce those if that's a side effect of something like carbidopa levodopa. So I think it's really important to focus on this, at least in the clinic visit, with your either neurologist or movement disorder specialist, because it can help with a lot of different domains of, of your Parkinson's disease. And if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me during the talk, okay? Again, this is meant to be interactive. So there's going to be three parts of the talk. The first part is we're going to talk about sleep disorders that result from Parkinson's disease, and what are some ways or maybe medications that can help with these particular sleep disorders. The second part of the talk are common Parkinson's symptoms that have an impact on your sleep. I think many people will relate to that part of it. And then the third part of the talk is, I should just say, one common sleep disorder that has an impact on Parkinson's disease. And we'll run through all three of these, starting with sleep disorders that result from Parkinson's. So anybody ever had trouble falling asleep? Okay, like half the room, maybe more than half the room, like three quarters of the room. What about trouble getting back to sleep when you wake up in the middle? Okay, almost. Yeah, a lot of people have raised their hands. And that's really the definition for insomnia. It's a trouble falling asleep in addition to trouble getting back asleep once you've woken up in the middle of the night. And that's really a big issue um, that people with Parkinson's and without Parkinson's experience. Um, it's very common in Parkinson's. I would say probably 50% of the people who come to my clinic in Fresno um, have difficulty falling asleep at night or they have trouble getting back to sleep once they've woken up for whatever reason. Um, a number of patients end up on medications like Ambien. Anyone heard of Ambien before? Ambien, Lunesta, you've all seen the commercials on TV, right? Many people end up on these medications, and I, I personally try to avoid these because of the impact it can have on your ability to think. But many people come into the clinic on medication because they have trouble falling asleep, and another provider has started them on that. And I think it should also be noted that depression and anxiety can have an impact on your ability to fall asleep. Um, depression and anxiety are both common in Parkinson's disease. I would say anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of people who suffer from Parkinson's may experience depressive symptoms or anxiety during the course of their um, disease. And that can really have a big impact on your ability to fall asleep if your mind is racing about things that you're anxious about in your daily life or work. Uh, I know certainly I have nights where I'm up, you know, thinking about work the next day and I have trouble falling asleep. So these are things that we also try to elicit during the visit with you and try to treat those. And so what's the impact of insomnia on Parkinson's disease? Well, certainly it can cause a late night. If you're lying in bed, eyes open, thinking about what's going on, um, that can really prolong your nighttime by minutes to hours. It can also disrupt a consolidated night of sleep. If you're able to fall asleep easily, but then you wake up and have trouble falling back asleep, you're still going to be tired the next day. So that's really a big issue. And anybody have trouble falling asleep and then the next day wake up feeling unrefreshed, like they were hit by a truck or just really exhausted? Okay, a number of people have raised their hands. Um, and so feeling unrefreshed the next day can be one of the symptoms of insomnia. And certainly, as we talked about, the impact of getting good sleep on Parkinson's can help with many of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. You know, um, having insomnia or trouble falling asleep or getting back to sleep can worsen your motor symptoms, including tremor, balance, um, and even stiffness. And so the treatment for insomnia really is multifactorial. And again, this is meant to prompt you to have a discussion with your physician um, about maybe uh, some different 
therapies or treatments that can help you falling back asleep or getting to sleep. And I think really improving sleep hygiene is the number one step that we typically take in order to help people with insomnia. So anybody use their iPhone or laptop or tablet at night before bedtime? Okay, yeah, you guys are acting like millennials now. I mean, <laughs> holy smokes. I do that too. And so one of the things that we talk about is reducing the amount of screen time or use of those types of devices before bed. And generally we recommend about an hour before bedtime, shutting off your tablet, turning off your TV, getting off the computer and your tablet. No more Netflixing at night before bedtime because that might keep you up actually. And surprisingly enough, iPhones now have a, a filter that filters out the blue light from your phone to reduce the impact of that on your drive to fall asleep. So you may want to look into that. I've turned that sleep filter on on my phone, so hopefully you will too. Um, one of the things I learned from uh, one of my mentors up at Stanford where I did my sleep fellowship was that your bedroom should be for sleep and for sex, and that's it, nothing else. And the reason why is because when our bedroom becomes something other than a place for sleep or sex, our body learns to continue that behavior. So for example, if you're sitting in bed watching TV and you're up you know, for an hour before you can fall asleep, your body's gonna learn that behavior and continue to propagate that. And so teaching your body that the bedroom is only for sleep, your bed is only for sleep, um, is something that can really help you to get to bed quicker during the nighttime and also stay asleep. Um, during the course of the night. Now anybody work late into the night? A couple of folks in the back, okay. Anybody eat before bedtime, get a snack? Okay, a few people, I like to do that too. Anybody, because exercise is important in Parkinson's, anybody exercise before bedtime or in the late evening? Okay, so a couple of people, not as many. So these are all things that you might wanna try avoiding before bedtime because they're all stimulants to your system. If you're working before bedtime, you're gonna start thinking about work and trouble shutting your mind off. When you're eating, your metabolism starts ramping up and that keeps your body up during the course of the night. And then of course, exercising also increases your metabolism and that can keep you up in the middle of the night as well. So generally, we tell people to avoid those things. I would say, you know, at least two hours before bedtime, if you can. We all have our lives to live. It's easy for me to give you rules to follow, but I think trying to incorporate that, that into your life may actually help you to fall asleep. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is a program that walks you through the process of learning about your sleep and what are different techniques to help you fall asleep and shut your mind off more quickly. And that's usually the first line of therapies that we provide to people who have insomnia because as movement disorder specialists, generally we try to avoid medication to help you fall asleep. And so Cognitive Behavioral Therapy is usually provided by a psychologist it can be provided online, and I've listed a couple of resources here. But this is really the most beneficial therapy for treatment of insomnia. And so it teaches you about the different processes in your body that help you to fall asleep, that keep you awake, and what are ways that you can maximize your potential in order to fall asleep. Now there's an application for your mobile device, and again, don't use that before bedtime, maybe during the daytime. But there's something called the CBTI Coach, which was developed up at Stanford, and this is an application that is almost sort of a surrogate for actually going through a cognitive behavioral therapy course. Um, I would recommend if you're having trouble falling asleep, start by downloading that application and it'll help you learn about your sleep. And what are different ways that you can relax, meditate, and help your mind calm down as you're falling asleep? And that's actually quite a helpful application. On the bottom here, I've listed two different websites of cognitive behavioral therapy that can be performed online. Um, sleepio.com and myshuteye.com, and these are proven therapies to help people who have trouble falling asleep or waking up in the middle of the night and falling back asleep to help them achieve better sleep. Now the one thing I want to warn you about is these two websites cost money. So again, if you're having issues with insomnia, you may want to talk about this with your physician first before enrolling in a program online where you have to pay money, okay? But these are things that might be helpful in having a discussion with your neurologist or movement disorder specialist could help. Okay, and I mentioned a discussion with your physician is key. And it may be helpful actually to get a referral to a sleep physician who is trained in these particular areas. Um, so you can just have a more in-depth discussion specifically about insomnia and trouble with your sleep. Um, you know, mood disturbances, I mentioned depression and anxiety. Those are things that can have an impact on your ability to fall asleep as well as getting back to sleep. Those may need medication treatment or cognitive behavioral therapy. So bringing that up to your physician is also important. And medications, again, I, I try to avoid these as much as possible. Um, but melatonin, anybody familiar with melatonin? 
Okay, about half the room. Holy smokes, okay. Uh, melatonin is actually a nice alternative to help your body fall asleep. And the reason why is because about four to five hours before bedtime, our body starts to produce melatonin, and it's a signal to our body, hey, it's time to start shutting down, it's time to start getting ready for bed. And so taking a little bit of melatonin around bedtime, maybe like two hours before bedtime, helps your body to receive that signal when maybe it's not getting that full signal, okay? Okay, restless legs. It's a discomfort or difficult to explain sensation in her legs that typically occurs at night. It improves with walking around or moving your legs, but if you sit down or, in, or are inactive, then that feeling tends to get worse too. Um, and that's a really uncomfortable sensation. I've only had it once before, but it was really hard to get back to sleep once I experienced that. Um, and so, you know, you describe pretty much everything. Worse at night, worse with rest, uh, improves with rest, I'm sorry, worse with rest, improves with activity, and this is a very common disorder. Um, in the general population, maybe five to 10% of people experience restless legs, but in Parkinson's, anywhere from 20 to 34% of people end up developing this type of sleep disorder. You feel jet lag because you're unable to fall asleep because you're consistently having to move your legs. And that's a big problem with restless legs. It can cause really late nights. For some people, it can wake you up in the middle of the night and then you have that sensation. Um, and it creates a significant discomfort that is quite either painful or just uncomfortable. And so the treatment of restless legs has really changed a lot over time. Last year, I think we talked a lot about medications. Um, but one of the things that we do, at least as sleep disorder specialists, is to check an iron level. Because iron, low iron levels have been felt to be associated with the presence of restless legs. That's one of the things that we first start checking. And if it's low, you know, we can provide iron supplementation or you can get it over the counter. And that may actually help reduce the presence of restless leg symptoms or the severity of it. Now, there are a number of medications that are prescribed for restless legs. And you know, each one of these has benefits and of course some of them may have side effects. So, the one that I personally like to start with first is a medication called gabapentin. Anybody familiar with gabapentin? Okay, so about a quarter of the room is familiar with this medication. This is a medication that's been around in neurology for a long time, but has really been found to be helpful for the treatment of restless legs. And the reason why I like to use it is because it doesn't interact with your Parkinson's medication. It's usually very well tolerated. The main side effect is that it makes you sleepy. So if you're having trouble falling asleep, it may actually help you get to sleep and can be very effective for treatment of restless legs. So that's the first one I like to try with people. Now there's a new medication that came out, I wanna say about five years ago, that was approved by the FDA for treatment of restless legs called Horizon. And this is just an extended version, or I should say a, a long-acting form of gabapentin um, that tends to be a little more expensive and harder to get, but it can be also very effective for the treatment of restless legs. And that's another one where it doesn't have an interaction with Parkinson's medications, which is good. Um, and it may help you fall asleep at nighttime. Now, I'm sure a number, a number of people in the room are familiar with these medications. Cinemet, Pramipexol, Ropinerol, anybody on these medications? Okay, a good chunk of the room. And these are medications that we typically give for Parkinson's, but believe it or not, these can actually help with the treatment of restless legs. Um, you know, I try to avoid Pramipexol and Ropinerol, and I'll tell you why. It's been discovered, at least over the past five years, 10 years, that those medications in the long term may actually worsen the symptoms of restless legs. Something called augmentation. That's the, the term that we use in medicine for it. And if you're experiencing symptoms earlier in the day when you're on these medications, or you're finding that your symptoms are much worse and you have to continually increase the dosage, that may represent augmentation. And that's actually a really big problem with these medications. So, um, I bring that up because if you are experiencing that, you may want to bring this up with your physician and have a discussion about it, and you may have to get off of those medications, okay? So I think it's very important actually to know about those. Okay, and speak with your physician about the right medication for you or the right adjustments to your medication. Now, REM behavior disorder, this happens to be um, quite an interesting um, disorder where people act out their dreams at night. You know, REM behavior disorder oftentimes is diagnosed many years before the diagnosis of Parkinson's. I mean, it can be 10 to 20 years before developing any sort of tremor or trouble walking where people act out their dreams. It could be anything from just talking in your sleep, it could be just kind of kicking or hitting your partner to actually acting out your dreams. I mean, I've had a patient who was staying over it with some family and completely trashed the garage where he was staying at because of REM behavior disorder. I mean, it's just absolutely incredible. And 
as you mentioned, you know, just very aggressive behaviors tend to come out with this particular disorder. And the reason why is because the dreams tend to be very violent or aggressive. You're either uh, attacking somebody or defending yourself from these particular, uh, whatever's happening in the dream. But the diagnosis is typically made either clinically in a visit with me, since I'm sleep disorder trained, um, or, I mean, I think the, the more important thing is to get it on a sleep study, um, where you've got loss of paralysis of your muscles during REM sleep. Typically when we're dreaming, you know, we're paralyzed. But what ends up happening as a result of this disorder is you act out your dreams and you lose that paralysis. And so seeing the sleep specialist usually is the first thing that, that people end up getting referred to. Um, but sleep specialists, I think, have increasingly recognized that referral to a movement disorder specialist to evaluate for um, signs or symptoms of Parkinson's disease is really important. Now, keep in mind that medications can also create an issue with REM behavior disorder and maybe sort of the, the underlying trigger. Um, but for somebody with Parkinson's, there are medications that could also worsen that. Um, things like antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, and that sort of thing. So that's important to keep in mind. Um, and so the impact of REM behavior disorder really is quite profound. Um, you know, it can increase your risk of falling out of bed. It can increase your risk for developing a fracture, which is an issue. Um, as the patient may get up from bed or hit furniture um, that's close to the bed, as I mentioned in that one of the YouTube videos I had posted. And then uh, you may put the partner, like we talked about, in harm's way if the behavior is quite violent. So identification of this particular sleep disorder is really important and treatment is paramount. So what are the things that can be helpful for treatment of REM behavior disorder? Well, one of the first things is a safe bedroom environment. So moving sharp furniture from the bedside. Um, some people put up bed rails or bed pads to make sure that the person doesn't fall out of bed. <clears throat> and then the, I forgot to put this up last year, I forgot to change the removal of sharp guns. So if you have bayonets by your bedside, you want to you get those away from the bed. I should say guns and sharp knives. If you have those in the room, you want to remove those or put them in a lock safe where you won't have access to it, okay? And then a number of people end up sleeping alone or in separate beds to reduce that risk of you know, getting a pillow put on your face or getting kicked or hit in bed. Um, there really are two medications for the treatment of REM behavior disorder. This is melatonin, what we talked about earlier. Melatonin I can use up to about 15 milligrams um, in order to treat this. And, and it can actually be very effective for the treatment of REM behavior disorder. But for the more severe cases, as your husband uh, experienced, you, know, you may need to use something called clonazepam, which is a medication that's used in both psychiatry and neurology for anxiety, sleep issues, but more importantly for the treatment of REM behavior disorder. So, um, you know, in that particular case, I may actually end up using both or just starting with clonazepam. So common symptoms of Parkinson's that can have an impact to sleep. Anybody get up at night to urinate? Okay, a lot of chuckles and probably half the room raised their hands. I mean, this is a major issue, right? I mean, we tell you to hydrate, we want you to drink a lot of water throughout the day, and then at nighttime you get up one, two, three, four, five times a night to urinate. And that has a big, that's a big impact on your sleep if you're having to get up and use the restroom all the time. And the reason why patients with Parkinson's develop this is because our, our nervous system that controls bodily functions ends up being involved <clears throat> with the disease process. Um, certainly with men, uh, you know, there are other issues that can lead to getting up at night to urinate, like enlarged prostates. Um, so that's an important thing to, to point out. But you know, this can occur multiple times a night. I've had patients who get up eight times a night to urinate, and that's, that's really just far too many times. Um, you know, the impact of nocturia on your Parkinson's, it wakes you up in the middle of the night uh, multiple times, and then the next day you're feeling exhausted, you may find that your motor symptoms of Parkinson's are worse. And so the treatment of this, you know, there are, I think a number of movement disorder specialists feel comfortable treating this particular issue, but if it gets to the point where you know, symptoms are quite severe, medications haven't worked all that much, then a referral to a urologist can be very helpful. And I think in Southern California, you guys are lucky to have access to a number of academic centers where people are specifically trained in urology, or the genitourinary system, as well as specializing in neurologic disorders. They have an understanding of um, this type of issue in somebody who has a neurologic disease. And so that, that may be actually very helpful. There are a number of medications that are used to treat um, urination overnight. And things like Flomax, I actually try to avoid that. Um, Tamsulosin. And the reason why is because these can, these can have an impact on your blood pressure, which is already an issue in Parkinson's. So I try really hard to stay away from those medications. Um, the three that I typically use, one is called Sanctura, the other one is called Merbetric, and the last one is called Vesicare. What kind of names are we, you know, giving to these medications, right? They're all quite funny. 
Um, but those are the three that really help to relax your bladder. In Parkinson's, the bladder tends to be overactive. It's like a muscle that's contracting all the time. So these medications help to relax the bladder, allow the bladder to fill up, and then you don't urinate quite as often. It'll help you sleep a little bit better through the night. And that's the reason why I like to use those. Other medications can be used but tend to have an impact on your blood pressure, so I try not to use those. And then finally, anybody ever had Botox for urine? I'll get to your question in a minute. Anybody ever use Botox for, ah, go ahead and stand up. And so what she had mentioned was she had actually been going through Botox for treatment of the urinary issue, but has not found that it's quite as helpful as maybe you expected it. And I've heard that a few times. You know, there are patients where the first treatment really works well, and then subsequent treatments may not be quite as effective. So I think, again, once you're at that point, it's really helpful to have a, a urologist who can help guide your therapy. Um, because the Botox, if it's not helping you, then we may need to get a little creative. Now, there are non-medication alternatives. And, and I bring these up because we also have to be practical as people, right? Um, getting up at night eight times to urinate is just too much. And if the medications aren't helping, I've had patients who just said, listen, I'm going to put on Depends. And if I urinate in the, in the diapers overnight, then that's just what I'm going to do because I hate waking up in the middle of the night. And so that's an option. I just put that up there because that, I've had a number of people who have done that. And then for men, there's a condom catheter, which goes over the penis and allows you to just urinate through the night without necessarily soiling you know, the diaper. You know, hallucinations. I've had patients who've described um, you know, that they have people in the room there staring at them as they're in bed. So it can be really pretty scary you know, if you think about it. And so this can result from Parkinson's itself. Certainly as the disease advances, you can develop hallucinations. Um, medications, you mentioned taking medication and then developing a hallucination as a result of that. And a number of the medications that we use for Parkinson's can create hallucinations. Um, infections, urinary tract infections can significantly worsen hallucinations. And that's usually one of the first things that I check for when somebody calls in having a first time hallucination or an acute onset of hallucinations. And typically, hallucinations tend to worsen at night, but they can occur throughout the day, again, depending on what the cause is. Um, and it can be anything from shapes and shadows to people and animals. I had, um, at the Fresno support group, I had a gentleman who was sitting in the front row. He was telling me about his hallucination that he had, some, he had a female in bed next to him, and he didn't mind that hallucination. And he was sitting next to his wife who didn't appreciate that. But I thought that was kind of a funny story for him to tell. And there was another patient at that group who said, you know, Doc, when I look over the edge of my bed, I see a big canyon. And so I'm really scared that if I get out of bed, I'm going to fall into that canyon. I mean, you can imagine how frightening that is for somebody to experience. So hallucinations can be really simple. It could be just a shadow or a flicker of a light. It can be something very complex or complicated, like a canyon right next to your bed. And so I kind of talked about the impact of hallucinations, that they can be disturbing or frightening. They can certainly prevent sleep or prevent you from falling back asleep. Um, and this can actually be a big can be a big problem for caretakers. Any caretakers in the room? OK, a number of caretakers. You guys are great people. Um, you know, I talk a lot about caregiver burnout in the, um, in the clinic visits that I have, because um, you know, it really takes a lot, I think, to care for a number of these symptoms. And hallucinations can be really frightening for caretakers to deal with, especially if you find that they're threatening. Um, and so uh, I think it, that's important to, to point out. Now, the treatment of hallucinations really depends on the cause. And again, this can result from a number of different issues. Reduction of medication may actually help with hallucinations or help reduce the hallucinations. But there's sort of a give and take there. If you reduce some of the medication you take for Parkinson's, like Cinnamet or Rapinarol or Pramipexil, it might have an impact on your mobility or your movement. So again, talking with your physician about the right adjustments for you is really important to do. Treatment of infections, certainly if you have a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia, that's something you want to get treated, and that will help the hallucinations go away or reduce. And then there are a number of medications that can be helpful for the treatment of hallucinations. If they're persistent, you know, they're not due to an infection, they're not due to other medications that you might be taking, something like Seroquel might be helpful. Clozapine is another medication that's been used. And then Nuplazid was an FDA-approved medication for the treatment of hallucinations in Parkinson's uh, about three to four years ago. And so, Again, an honest discussion with your physician about this, if this is happening to you, I think is really important. Okay, Wearing off. Wearing off is when you take your medication, it's working, and then before your next dose of medication, it stops working. It's not as effective, and you get return of your symptoms like tremor, stiffness, trouble walking. Some people even get cloudy thinking, might get confused. 
and that's a big problem. So that's what wearing off means for those who, who didn't know what wearing off is. I think it's a, it's a really important thing to talk about because we take medications during the daytime, right? But at night when you go to sleep, there's a period there if you're sleeping, if you're able to sleep for seven or eight hours, there's a period there where you're not taking medication for a large chunk of time. And so you can have wearing off and that can be an issue. It may be the same as downtime. I haven't particularly used that term, but usually, you know, if, that, if downtime means that your symptoms are coming back, the symptoms of Parkinson's are resurfacing, then that's, that's potentially what that could mean. Yeah. And so I mentioned tremor, stiffness, rigidity. You can imagine that those symptoms would wake you up in the middle of the night if you're having more tremor, or if your arm is getting stiff or more rigid on you. That could certainly wake you up from sleep. And again, as we talked about, it usually means that it's because of too little medication. The medication is not getting you through the night. And so what do we do to, um, what do we do to help with that? Well, an adjustment or change in medication can certainly be helpful. Um, you know, there are a number of medications out there that are long-acting forms of carbidopa, levodopa. Something like Cinemet CR, or controlled release, Ritari, which is a new medication that came out about five years ago. These are more long-acting, extended versions of carbidopa, levodopa that can really help you kind of get through the night. So it's important, again, to have a discussion with your neurologist. And there are other medications, too, that can help. Um, but I think, again, having a discussion with your neurologist about this is important. Now, I do want to mention one thing. If you're having frequent wearing off during the daytime and during the night, you know, you want to look at medications, but, you know, you may also want to talk about deep brain stimulation with your neurologist, too. Okay, dystonia. This is a funky term that I might have to define for people. Anybody experience dystonia? Yeah, so dystonia is an abnormal and prolonged muscle contraction. Um, that can be very painful, and it can be very obvious to the people around you. And it can be anything from a hand dystonia, where the hand tends to cramp up. It could be a foot dystonia, where the foot turns inward or turns outward. It could be your big toe, kind of curls up or curls down. Um, and it could even be a neck dystonia. Some people with Parkinson's develop cervical dystonia, where your neck turns like this, okay? And again, these are all abnormal prolonged muscle cramping that can certainly wake you up in the middle of the night if you experience that. And you mentioned that it could be related to too much medication, dystonic dyskinesia. Um, it could also be related to too little medication. So there's kind of a two-fold issue there with dystonia. And that can certainly wake you up in the middle of the night if you experience that abnormal cramping and cause significant discomfort. And you're nodding your head that you experience that. And so, you know, the treatment of that, again, if it's related to too little or too much medication, adjustment of your medication for Parkinson's can be very helpful. Um, and certainly Botox, which is something that neurologists or movement disorder specialists can provide, can be helpful to relax that abnormal muscle contraction and calm it down. So the question is, can dystonia be related to abnormal calcium or magnesium? And the answer is, dystonia typically is related to an imbalance of the dopamine system in the brain. And so if you're getting too much dopamine medication, <coughs> or if you're getting too little dopamine medication, then that, that may actually be creating the dystonia. Um, calcium, magnesium typically don't create issues with that prolonged and sustained muscle cramping, but you might get you know, some kind of twitches in the legs at night if your calcium or magnesium is off. So it's a little bit different. You know, muscle relaxants are sometimes the first medications that we try to help with dystonia. My experience is that they're not very effective. Um, but if you do have a muscle relaxant, for example, something like Flexerol or Baclofen, that has helped your dystonia, then I would just stick with it. Yeah, but I found that those typically don't tend to be very helpful. We're gonna talk about one common sleep disorder that has a pretty profound impact on, uh, on Parkinson's disease, and that's obstructive sleep apnea. You know, obstructive sleep apnea is a problem with your breathing during sleep. And it can be anything to where you have a reduction in the amount of breathing that you have to completely stopping breathing. And that's usually what we find on the sleep study. Um, symptoms that often indicate sleep apnea are snoring. Anybody here snore? Okay, some people don't want to admit it. I see some hesitation. I snore at night, I have sleep apnea, so I'll just put that out there to make you feel a little more comfortable. But snoring can be a marker for this. If you completely stop breathing or have a pause in your breathing, that's a marker for sleep apnea. People who wake up frequently during the middle of the night, maybe gasping for air, coughing or choking, those are symptoms of sleep apnea as well. Daytime sleepiness and taking naps. For sure, sleep apnea is one of the things that you want to evaluate for and rule out, because that may be having an impact on your daytime. Now, what's the impact of obstructive sleep apnea on Parkinson's disease? 
really, there's a lot of different ways that sleep apnea can have an impact. Number one, it causes multiple awakenings at night. It can make you really sleepy during the daytime. And anybody here take a dose of their Parkinson's medication and get really sleepy afterwards? OK. A couple of folks raise their hands. You know, things like Primapexol, Rapinerol, Cinemet can make you sleepy anyway in the absence of sleep apnea. So you can imagine that having a disorder like this that worsens your daytime sleep and this further complicates the issue and makes you just less energetic during the daytime and taking frequent naps. Um, sleep apnea can have an impact on other medical issues, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart arrhythmias or regular heart rhythms, stroke. And these are all really important in the treatment of um, <coughs> you have to excuse me, like I said, I'm a little under the weather. Um, you know, these can have a big impact on just your overall medical health. And so I think it's really important to identify sleep apnea if you have this. Now, specifically as it relates to Parkinson's disease, you know, the, the idea over time is that Parkinson's disease is a progressive disorder that, you know, you have an accumulation of abnormal protein that just consistently happens over time. And I don't think any research has looked at sleep apnea and sort of the impact on the development of that disease, but I've certainly seen people who significantly improve with regards to their balance, their posture, their tremor, as well as these other symptoms during the daytime as it relates to treatment of sleep apnea and Parkinson's disease. So, you know, again, I have a unique perspective as a sleep specialist and a movement disorder specialist, but anytime somebody has any, any of the symptoms on this last slide, I would say go get, um, you know, go get evaluated by a sleep specialist with a sleep study because treatment of sleep apnea can just have such a significant impact on your daytime as well as on your Parkinson's symptoms. I think it's really important to do, actually. So the diagnosis, as I mentioned, typically is with a sleep study. There's two types of sleep studies that you can do. One is a test that you take home with you and you sleep with it overnight. And they measure your breathing, again, to measure if you're having pauses in breathing or a reduction in your breathing. <clears throat> the second is where you actually spend the night in a sleep clinic, which some people find a little bit difficult because the beds aren't necessarily as comfortable as the one that you have at home. Um, but that certainly is a much more extensive test. We get a lot more information that way. Um, the treatment of sleep apnea, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this because the, the treatment, I feel, for folks with Parkinson's, it was a little bit more limited because surgeries are not often recommended um, uh, you know, in folks who are older than 16 who have Parkinson's. And so, you know, treatment with a CPAP machine. Anybody familiar with a CPAP or have a CPAP? Okay. And so it's a machine that essentially supports your breathing during the middle of the night. And I have one too. I use a CPAP machine at night. Um, it supports your breathing to help prevent those issues that we talked about with the snoring, pauses in breathing that lead to the development of daytime sleepiness and other issues. Um, I wanted to bring up something called an oral appliance or a dental device for the treatment of sleep apnea. And this is something that really is less invasive than the CPAP machine. As you can imagine, some people are claustrophobic, and so having a mask on your face at night um, can be pretty scary or freaky, especially if it's blowing air into your nose and mouth. So the oral appliance is essentially you know, a mouth guard that's created for your top and bottom teeth that's made out of hard plastic. And the idea is that it pushes your lower jaw forward in order to open up the, the, um, the back of your throat, which is the start of your breathing tube. And in folks, again, who have claustrophobia, or in folks who have Parkinson's who maybe aren't quite as adept at using the CPAP machine, the oral appliance can be quite helpful, actually, in treatment of sleep apnea. So I bring that up as another option. Um, some people actually put a couple of extra pillows to help prop you up and get rid of the effect on gravity on your breathing tube, and that tends to help as well. Again, the hope is that this was a practical talk to just bring up issues for you to think about and talk about with your, with your neurologist or movement disorder specialist. Not necessarily the lights, but really more just the, the devices that you use that kind of keep your mind stimulated. You know, an iPhone, tablet, computer, keep you connected to the world, work, friends, family. And so reducing that right before bedtime can really help your mind to calm down and relax. And you can still have the lights on. That's OK. Um, we're not telling you to sit in the dark for an hour before bedtime, but that's an important thing to clarify. <laughs> yeah, so things like reading, meditating, some people do yoga. I think you, you guys did some yoga. Is that correct? So that's kind of a cool thing to do before bedtime. Just help your body and your mind relax. Yeah, so the answer is yes. So the studies that have looked at sleep apnea, for example, 
or something that interrupts your sleep and reduces the amount of sleep that you get. There's actually been studies that show that your ability to focus and concentrate are reduced when you don't get enough sleep or you have a sleep disorder that impacts your quality of sleep. And so, you know, in Parkinson's, the cognitive changes that tend to occur really are, at least in the beginning, more on your attention, your concentration, and your focus. So it's almost a two-fold issue. If you're not getting enough sleep, you're having a double negative impact on your ability to focus and pay attention. I think a lot of it depends on the provider and their comfort with, uh, I should say your physician, and their comfort with the medications and their understanding of the research that's been done. Um, you know, for insomnia, I tend to use just three milligrams and then kind of go from there. Because the, the main issue is there's usually something underlying insomnia, whether it's depression or anxiety, uh, racing thoughts during the course of the night. And I really try to avoid medications and melatonin. Um, if it gets to a point where, you know, doc, I really need something, then I, I try melatonin first and I'll start with 0.5 milligrams and then work my way up slowly to three milligrams. Everybody's different. You know, our sleep, the amount of sleep that we need is, is genetically based. I would say a good target for somebody, you know, who's older than 60 probably is somewhere around seven hours a night, maybe a little bit more. Um, if you're getting less than seven hours a night, let's say like six and a half, it's probably okay, but your body and your mind are going to tell you if you're not getting enough sleep. Um, so it really, it does depend on the person, but I would say a good target is seven, seven and a half hours for somebody who's about 60. Now, the amount of sleep that you get as you get older also, also reduces over time. So they've looked at, you know, normal aging over time, and they've looked at the amount of sleep that you get, and we know that we get more light sleep and less deep sleep as we get older, and the amount of sleep that we get also reduces. So keep that in mind. As I mentioned, there are two types of sleep tests. One is a home sleep test where you've it's really not invasive. Um, there's a couple of different things that you do. You've got a little monitor under your nose and over your mouth um, that connects to a little machine. You've got two belts, one on your chest and one on your belly. And then you've got an oxygen measurement device on your finger. Um, and then you take that home with you, you set it up, fall asleep with it, and usually take it back the next day um, to the sleep lab. Now, a test in the sleep clinic is gonna be far more extensive. You're gonna have a number of electrodes or measurement devices on top of your head, you're going to have a couple on your eyes, on your chin, and then you're going to have some measurement devices, two belts, chest and belly. You're also going to have a monitor on your heart. Yeah. And then you've got the oxygen measurement device as well. So the comment was, I can't imagine falling asleep. Um, you know, it, it's interesting because at least in our sleep center, we do at least five a night, and people do tend to fall asleep, believe it or not. And that's because as we get towards the end of the day, our sleep drive really ramps up and helps us to fall asleep, even if we've got, you know, all that, <laughs> all of that monitoring equipment on us. Yeah, I've been through a sleep study and uh, I felt the same way. How am I going to fall asleep? Well, sure enough, I fell asleep with it, so, yeah. Well, it depends because you can certainly have just sleep walking by itself. Um, you can also have night terrors, I think, which is what you mentioned, um, night terrors or screaming episodes at night. So it's really important to get a sleep study done if you're having a problem figuring out what exactly is happening because there are very specific criteria used to diagnose something like REM behavior disorder on a sleep study. Yeah, that's a great question. So as I mentioned during the talk, medications for Parkinson's can make you sleepy during the daytime, believe it or not. Um, and specifically, the medications that replace dopamine, things like Primapexol, Rapinarol, Carbidopa, Levodopa, and even like a Nupro patch, for example, those can make you sleepy during the daytime uh, because dopamine is a neurochemical that's involved in our, in our sleep, um, our uh, drive to fall asleep. So that's one thing. Um, certainly an underlying sleep disorder like insomnia, obstructive sleep apnea, something that's regularly awakening you during the course of the night or interrupting your sleep will have an impact on your daytime sleepiness. You know, sometimes it's hard to, di to distinguish between fatigue and sleepiness. So there are a lot of patients with Parkinson's who often feel just really tired during the day. Not necessarily that you're gonna fall asleep, but just kind of fatigued. You know that feeling that you get when you have like a cold or a flu and you just feel like kind of icky? Um, you know, that, that's a different, a different situation than maybe from the Parkinson's itself. And 
that's a symptom that's really poorly understood. Um, there's been some research that's, that's looked into that, but we don't have a great explanation for why that fatigue happens. But certainly if you're sleepy during the daytime, it may be related to medication, but it may also be related to an underlying sleep disorder. Yeah. The answer is, well, it sort of depends on what, what answer you're looking for. So certainly if you stop using your CPAP, you're going to feel more tired. You're going to feel probably uh, a little more grumpy or irritable. You're probably going to have less ability to focus and pay attention. Um, I don't know if there are any permanent problems that happen in the brain on sort of a uh, cellular or molecular level as a result of obstructive sleep apnea. But you know, the way that I think about it is if obstructive sleep apnea can lead to the development of things like high blood pressure, stroke, irregular heart rhythms, then certainly there probably is something that um, that happens in the brain as a result of untreated sleep apnea that's permanent. So I would recommend that if you do have sleep apnea and you're having symptoms of it, that you probably should get treated and use your CPAP if you can. Now, again, you know, we all have to be practical, and sometimes using a machine and a mask that blows air into your face isn't always the most practical thing, right? So if you can chat with your sleep specialist or get a referral to a sleep specialist to talk about other um, potential treatments, then that might be helpful for you. To be honest with you, I don't know what the answer to that is. My personal experience with NuPro, uh, the NuPro patch, is that many people who get on it, you know, it's used to basically help smooth out your day. I mean, you put on a patch once a day, the idea is that you get the medication at a consistent basis throughout the course of the day. Um, you know, I haven't found it to be quite as effective, maybe, as just something like Carbidopa, Levodopa, or even Pramipexil or, uh, or Requip. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, pharmaceutical companies tend to often uh, promote their medications, and Nupro came out, I think, around a decade ago, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, so I'm not sure why it hasn't caught more traction, but my personal experience is I don't use it that much because I haven't found it to be quite as effective. Now, again, everybody with Parkinson's is different, so one medication for one person may not work the same way for the other. You know, um, as a neurologist, I tend to avoid referring people to chiropractors. And uh, the reason why is because there's variability in, you know, the different chiropractors that you might work with. Um, and certainly I've had, uh, just sort of from personal experience, friends or family who've said they've gone to a chiropractor and they get manipulations or adjustments. And it helps for a little bit of time, but then you have to continue to go back on a more frequent basis. And so. Um, I don't know if there's something where adjustments or manipulations tend to accelerate the underlying issue. I mean, it helps for a little bit and then tends to recur. Uh, as it relates to Parkinson's, I, you know, I, I don't know what the data is. And I'm not sure it's actually been looked at, but understanding that Parkinson's results from a loss of dopamine over time, to me, usually represents that you need a medication to help you. And we've got a number of medications that have been proven to help with the motor symptoms and, and even other non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. Yeah. You know, acupuncture actually can be quite helpful for a number of different, um, a number of different disorders. Again, kind of getting to what you were asking about with the, the chiropractor, you know, Parkinson's disease is because, you know, you have a loss of dopamine production over time. That's what happens inside the brain that leads to Parkinson's. And so um, acupuncture may be helpful for some of the non-motor features of Parkinson's, maybe like depression, anxiety, helping you to relax and calm down. Um, but I, I'm not necessarily sure it will help with tremor, for example, or stiffness related to um, Parkinson's disease. Not that I found. Other people may have found that, but that's just Medicare, unfortunately, doesn't cover a lot of different things. I mean, a number of the medications that we talked about today, we really have to fight for them to even cover a portion of those medications. Now, one of the tricks that I sometimes use is recommend physical therapy, for example, for low back, if you have a low back issue. And then you can prescribe massage therapy as part of the physical therapy to help. Um, so that's one way to kind of get around it. But if you just want to go to a spa and get a massage, I'm pretty sure Medicare won't, won't cover that. It'd be nice, because then I'd prescribe it for myself. That'd be great. The genetic cause of Parkinson's really is less than, I want to say, 5%. If there's a particular gene that's passed on within the family over time, um, it's a very rare cause of Parkinson's disease. You know, the, the underlying issue is that you've got development of an abnormal protein called alpha-synuclein that ends up depositing in the nervous system over time and leads to loss of cells that produce dopamine. That's the main issue. Um, and, you know, 
there are a lot of environmental exposures that can probably predispose you to Parkinson's. In the Central Valley where, where I'm from, and I think you're from too, right? Um, you know, exposure to pesticides puts people at risk for development of Parkinson's. And that research was done at UCLA here in Southern California. Um, and there certainly are another, uh, there are many other environmental exposures like heavy metal exposure that can put you at risk for development of Parkinson's. Um, folks who served, you know, at the VA, it's thought that maybe some of the chemicals uh, Vietnam veterans were exposed to may lead to Parkinson's. So uh, most of the causes of Parkinson's tend to just happen, and there may be an environmental trigger that then leads to the development of that abnormal protein. Um, but a genetic cause of Parkinson's is quite rare. Um, and although they have been identified around the world, it's like less than 5%, I think. Yeah. Great. Thank you, guys. Yeah.